Brian. I'm currently at Etsy. Um, I'm going to talk a bit uh, about approximate collections. Um, so, uh, so approximate collections. Why would we ever want an approximate collection? And what do I mean by that? So, um, there are times when you have a collection, sort of conceptually, of an unbounded number of items, or a very, very large number of items, right? Millions of items, billions of items. Um, but you've only got a bounded amount of memory. And so you want to get some of the advantages, some of the summaries or aggregates or, or properties of a collection like a set, um, but you want to do it uh, without actually storing all of the items. Uh, and so necessarily what you're going to have is an approximation. So almost everybody, I'm, I'm assuming in this talk that everybody in this talk uh, knows bloom filters, uh, which are probably the like, best known sort of approximate set. Um, the context of this talk is, uh, is the Algebird uh, library, which, uh, which came out of Twitter. Um, and if you were in Oscar's talk earlier, you might have seen a bit about it. Um, it uh, it's, a, it's an abstract algebra framework, um, but, uh, but specifically focused on data structures that, that you might use in uh, streaming or in distributed computation like Hadoop um, for aggregation. So in practice, a lot of those end up being um, approximate collections. Um, this came out of the Scalding project, which I started at Twitter, and Oscar extracted uh, a bunch of stuff from it that, uh, that he wrote and, uh, and added, and a bunch of us have contributed to it. Um, but most of the credit uh, for a lot of the code you see in this talk should go to Oscar. Um, I, I, there's no contents may settle during shipping. Um, what I'm showing you appropriately is sort of approximate code. A bunch of it is real code from Algebird. Um, some of it is sort of APIs that we're thinking about but haven't completely implemented yet or it's only sort of spottily implemented. Some of it is sort of a little bit, um, you know, alighted just for, for ease of presentation. So um, the concepts are all there. Most of the implementation is there, but um, some of this is kind of up in the air and, and part of the point of this talk is, is maybe to have some discussion about what it should look like. So if you were going to implement a Bloom filter, kind of the, the, the kind of simplest, most naive API that it might look like uh, is this. Uh, so you, know, you, you need to be able to update it with a new item, um, and then you need to be able to query as to whether or not the Bloom filter contains that item. Um, and, uh, and the Bloom filter, um, you know, most of you probably know this, that if the item is not there, if the item has never been added to the Bloom filter, it will, it will answer false. Um, uh, excuse me, if it answers false, that means that the item definitely was never added. If it answers true, um, it might mean the item was added, it might be a false positive, right? Um, and uh, so, you know, that's, that's maybe how you might think of this, how you might implement it um, in Java or something. Um, in Scala, um, we want to make this nicer probably in a couple of ways. Um, one is we probably want this to be immutable. Um, and uh, the other is that we can make this sort of start to look like a set because that's conceptually what this is. So we might have the plus for the element um, and have that return, return a new instance of the Bloom filter. Um, and we might have some way to union two of these things, right? We might have plus plus for that. So, you know, this thing and contains, right? Which is also part of the set API in Scala. So this thing starts to look a little bit like a set. Um, and it, it's worth asking, once this starts to look a little bit like a set, what else from set might we want to add here? So, you know, all of the stuff um, that makes set iterable is just totally out. Right? Because the nature of a Bloom filter is that you do not have these elements, and so you cannot iterate through these elements. So we can't do, you know, for each map, flat map, any of that stuff, right? Um, can we do size, right? Because size is another thing that sets tend to have. Um, and it turns out that in a Bloom filter, you can do size. Um, there's a paper uh, that describes how you can estimate the number of items that have been added to a Bloom filter, basically just looking at how many bits have been set in the Bloom filter, right? And as long as it hasn't gotten too filled up, right, once it gets filled up past a certain point, your estimate's going to be really bad. But in general, you can actually get a pretty decent estimate. Um, and so, you know, when you say things like pretty decent estimate, uh, you know, it's natural to ask, like, how good is the estimate? And in fact, the paper gives bounds, right? And the bounds tend to be of this form, right? If I tell you the estimate that I have of the size, um, I can give you a sort of minimum and a maximum, right, of, of what I think the, the range is that the size is in fact going to be. And I can also give you a probability um, that the true size is within these bounds, 
right? And that's sort of like, you know, if you see stats reported as like, you know, plus or minus 5% 19 times out of 20, right? It's the same pattern, right? I've got, a, I've got a bound, I've got a confidence bound, and then I've got a probability that the true value is in fact within that confidence bound. And so you can end up with an API that looks kind of like this, right? Um, and it turns out also that if you have an estimate of the size of a Bloom filter, um, one of the other things that you can do is you can estimate the false prob uh, or give a probability for the false positive rate, right? Um, and so that's useful because when you ask and, and you get back a true, you may want to know like how much can I rely on this true. So this API is starting to get a little bit clunky, I think. Um, you know, with all of these different things, asking different probabilities, asking different sizes, min size, max size. Um, so, uh, so it would be nice to clean that up a little bit. And one way that we can clean that up is by introducing some new types. So rather than returning a Boolean and having the separate method for the probability that that Boolean is wrong, um, we can return an approximate Boolean. And similarly, rather than returning a size and then having all of these separate methods giving us some bounds on this, uh, we can re return, say, an approximate long. So, um, and, and these types exist within Algebra. Um, so what does this look like? Well, an approximate Boolean, uh, you know, basically uh, is just a Boolean value and a probability, right? Um, so, you know, actually in the case of a Bloom filter, if it returns false, that probability is going to get set to one, right? So it's going to give you back an, a, an approximate Boolean that is in fact an exact Boolean. Um, but if it returns true, it's going to give you, you know, some probability, which is the same as that, like, probability of false positive that we saw. And now that you have these types, it's interesting to think about, like, what operations can we do on these types, right? So in the case of approximate Boolean, um, we can, for example, negate it. Um, and uh, the, the first time that I saw this code, it actually threw me for a second because I kind of expected to invert the probability. Somehow in my head I was like, oh, that should be one minus prob, but no, that's not right. If we know with some probability p that we have true, then it's that same probability p um, that the negation of that is false, right? Um, and so that's all this is doing, right? It's giving you a new approximate Boolean uh, that uh, flips the bit and gives you, keeps the probability the same, right? Um, Things like and are also possible. It gets a little bit more uh, involved. Um, but if you sort of read through this code, what's going on is that um, if we're anding true with true, right, the approximate true we get back has the same probability as multiplying those two probabilities, right? Um, so it's true with the probability of, you know, their, their combined, their joint probability, right? Um, otherwise, it's false with the max of their two probabilities. Right? Um, so, you know, if, if, if I tell you that this one is like very probably false, and then I end that with something that's, that, that is approximately true, then it doesn't matter how approximate that true value is because I know the false is really, really good. Right? Um, and, uh, and so that's, uh, excuse me, it's, it's, the, um, it's the maximum of the false probabilities. Right? The true probabilities don't matter. Um, so, you know, or you can implement it's very similar, it's just everything's kind of inverted, right? Um, okay, now we also had this approximate long. Um, what does that look like? Well, again, we're, we're just kind of encapsulating in this type the same methods that we had before, right? So we've got a min, we've got an estimate, we've got a max, and then we've got a probability that the true value is, is within that range. Um, and there's no reason we have to do this specifically for long. We can do this for any numeric, right? So we might as well use the numeric type class and, and do that. Um, and so what can we do with, with an approximate uh, numeric? Um, well, probably the most important thing we want to do, apart from just directly reading um, the estimate in the range, is asking whether or not a certain value that we're interested in is within these bounds, right? And kind of nicely, what that returns is an approximate Boolean. Um, you know, what else might we want to do? Um, you know, we can add approximate numbers, we can, we can subtract approximate numbers. Um, I'm not showing the implementations because that's not really the point, but you can go look at the source code. Um, you can kind of imagine what the, what the manipulations on the probability would be. So, okay. Um, you know, can we generalize this, right? So Bloom filters do this, um, but, uh, but do we, can we just think of a, of a general approximate set interface of which Bloom filter is simply one implementation, right? Um, and, and what would the other implementations be? So um, another one that, that we use a lot in Algebra is hyperloglog. Log. -log. Um, so hyperloglog -log is this fancy distinct value estimation algorithm, right? So, so Bloom filter was really designed for the contains operation, right? Bloom filter is optimized to have good bounds on contains. 
Um, Hyperlog log was optimized to have good bounds on the size method, right? Um, it can do contains, it does contains kind of jankily, which is that uh, if you have a hyperlog log and you want to know whether it contains something, you just add something to it and see whether the size changed, right? Um, which is not, you know, going to give you the best bounds, right? Um, but on the other hand, it has really good bounds on size. Um, so I think Oscar mentioned in his talk that if you're willing to give it, you know, like 15K or so, then you get under 1% error, um, which is pretty good. And I think if you give it 1K, you still get within like 2% error. So how does it work? Um, I'm not going to explain this talk how hyperloglog -log works, but I'm going to explain how one of the earlier in the family of this algorithms that, that came from the same people works. Um, so if you have n values in this set and you see them in a stream or whatever, you know, um, however you're computing this, every, every value that you see, you hash using, uh, you know, a good uniform hash function that let's say, for the sake of argument, hashes them to, to between zero and one. Um, and I've got little marks on the number line that are supposed to represent, like, where those hash values fall, right? So this is sort of supposed to represent, like, a set of, I don't even know what that is, 10 items or something, right? Um, and it's more or less uniformly, I mean, it is, it's not perfect, but it's uniformly distributed um, from zero to one. Right? Um, so, okay, that's fine. Um, now let's think about the distance between any two of these adjacent hash values, right? Um, so let's call that W. Um, so what do we expect W to be? Well, if we have the distance between zero to one and we're uniformly distributing these things across it, um, we expect that to be one over N, where N is the number of items in the set, right? Um, I think that's, that's fairly straightforward. And, and that's true, you know, wherever we're looking at two adjacent ones or if we're looking at the distance between zero and the first one, uh, the minimum one, right, that's, that's always going to be true. Um, so, okay, that's cool because that means that if all that we do, instead of remembering all of these, is just as we're streaming through this, we just keep the minimum one we've seen, right, now we have an estimator of the total number of items. Right? So we just uh, look at W, we do 1 over W, and that's our N. Um, and that's going to be actually a pretty bad estimator, right? It's going to be very high variance. Um, and so a better thing to do is to keep the K minimum that we see, right? The K lowest hashes that we see. And now we've got KW, and K over N is, is going to, you know, expect it to be KW, and so we can again estimate N, and, and now it's just a trade-off of space versus accuracy, right? So the more K, you know, the larger, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, an approximate set we're, we're deciding to keep, um, the better error is going to be. Um, so that's cool um, and, uh, and very useful. And hyperlog log is basically this, but like better optimized. Um, so there's another one um, that we use in Algebraid, uh, which, is, uh, which is minhash. Um, and, uh, and minhash is optimized for a different purpose, again, um, which is set similarity. So the assumption is you have a couple of these approximate sets um, and you want to see how similar they are to each other. Um, so how does that work? Well, it actually starts out very similarly, um, which is to say that you have some hash function and every item in the set, um, you run through this hash function and you keep the lowest one, right? So, so far this looks almost exactly the same. Um, but, uh, but you do something different with it. Um, and uh, if you have two sets um, and they have the same hash function and you've kept the lowest one of each, um, the question you ask is, what's the probability uh, that the two sets are going to have the same lowest hash value? Um, and it turns out, and I don't think I want to walk through a proof of this, um, but hopefully people can kind of intuitively see this, that the probability that these two sets are going to have the same lowest value uh, is the same as the size of their intersection divided by the size of their union, right? So if you sort of, uh, you know, a hand wavy proof, right, is that if you sort of think of like combining these um, and, and that's going to, you know, have as many elements as the size of the union um, and then ask like what's the chance that that's going to change the lowest one um, that's sort of the probability of, you know, how many of them intersect divided by how many of them union, right? Um, so anyway, that, that quantity, the size of the intersection divided by the size of the union, is actually a, a common similarity metric, um, which is Jacquard similarity, or one minus that is, is the Jacquard distance, which is the actual metric, right? Um, so that's cool, but, you know, 
you're just going to get a binary one or zero out of this, right? So knowing that like, you know, these sets are, yes, they're similar with this probability, or no, they're not similar uh, with this probability is not actually that helpful. What you want is to know how similar they are. Um, and so what you do is you do this k times with k different hash functions, right? So instead of just keeping, so the difference between this and the last one I was describing, right, is that the last one I was describing, you have one hash function and you keep the k lowest values. Here you have k hash functions and you keep the one lowest value for each of them. Right? And then you can do this pairwise comparison where you look, okay, for this hash function, does the lowest value that I've kept match? For this hash function, does the lowest value that I've kept match? For this hash function. And you do that k times um, and you see how many matches you get. And so the number of matches divided by k is your estimate of that probability, which is equal to the Jacquard similarity. Right? Um, and so from that you can get similarity. And so, okay. Um, this sort of requires new extensions to our, to our approximate set API, right? Um, which is, uh, uh, we want Jacquard similarity um, as an approximate double. And then actually, if you have their similarity, if you have their Jacquard similarity, and you have their size, um, you can compute the size of their intersection. And, uh, and I should have put the math up here. Right, but if you think about it, if you take their, if you take them, you have a union operation here, so you can get the size of their union. Um, you have the Jacquard similarity, which is the size of the intersection over the size of the union, so you multiply those two things, and you end up with the size of the intersection, right? Um, so this is this weird kind of asymmetry between unions and intersections that, that you tend to see in these structures which is that unions are sort of free in the sense that they're, they're lossless, right? You don't increase the error by and large by unioning two sets. And so you can kind of union all day long and take the size, right? Um, but intersection is kind of, you get one shot at it, basically, right? Um, because your error is just going to keep going up. And so usually you, you, you have an actual union operation, right? You have a size operation, and then you have this intersection size operation, and sometimes I didn't put code up here for it, but sometimes you can do like an n-way intersection and that's a little bit better um, and a little bit more useful. But in general, this is, this is kind of um, what you get. So um, this part of the API I'm not like super happy about in that it would be, so for example, similarity and intersection size are related quantities, um, but some of these approximate sets are better at estimating one, and some of these approximate sets are better at estimating the other, and so you don't really want to get the user to um, just use one and do the multiplication themselves, because then you might end up with too high bounds. So, um, so there's that. Um, so that's approximate set stuff, um, and, uh, and it would be nice also if there were approximate map um, approximate list kind of doesn't make sense because really lists, what you want to do is iterate over them and again, you can't iterate over them. But approximate map might make sense. We don't have yet anything that totally feels like an approximate map, but one thing that we do have is what you might call, um, and this name isn't in the code, but I just made it up for the talk, an approximate frequency set. Um, so what I mean by this is it's basically an approximate set. You're still adding elements to it. Right? But not only can you ask, does this set contain this element, you can say, how many times did I add this element to this set? And that can be really valuable. Right? So you have an operation that's not quite get, but it's like get frequency or get count. Um, and again, that's going to return an approximate number. And uh, we only have one instance of this implemented. Uh, certainly there are other structures that would implement something like that, but that's the count min sketch. Um, and so I'll, I'll, I'll briefly describe how a count min sketch works. So, um, do you imagine having um, just, a, just a bunch of buckets, right? Um, a fixed size number of buckets, each of which is a counter. Uh, and each time an element comes in, uh, you have a hash function that's going to choose a bucket for that element, and you're going to increment the counter in that bucket, right? Um, and, uh, and so whatever, I have k, k hashes to that bucket, I'm going to increment you know, from 4 that it was before to 5. Um, and now I want to know later on um, how many times have I seen k. Well, I use the same hash function, I get to the same bucket, I look it up. Um, now, is that the number of times I've seen k? I mean, no, probably not. Um, it is an upper bound on the number of times I've seen k, right? Because um, I have incremented that bucket at least as many times as I have seen k. But it's probably an, quite an overestimate 
because I have also no doubt seen other things, unless my number of buckets here is like on the same order as my number of items, in which case this is kind of pointless, um, I have no doubt also seen other things that hash that same bucket, and so that number is going to be too high. And so how do I solve this? Um, so there's a common pattern here, which is sort of the how do I solve this is basically we do this k times, right? So again, we do this k times. We have k different sets of buckets with k different hash functions, right? And every time the element comes through, we get the k different buckets and increment each of them. And then when we want to do the query, we look at the k different buckets that it hashes to and we take the minimum one, right? Um, because all of these are upper bounds. So now we have k different upper bounds. And so if we take the lowest of the k different upper bounds, then we get still an upper bound, but we get the best upper bound, right? And so we've managed to reduce our error um, by having more of these. And, uh, and so that's actually um, all the stuff that I've prepared, and I went through that a little quickly. Um, I'm, uh, I'm from Etsy. Um, my team um, is, uh, is a distributed team, entirely distributed team. We don't commute to the office, um, so this group doesn't commute. But um, if there are uh, any questions, uh, I'd like to take them. Yeah, so the question was, can I talk about some of the use cases for these various operators, right? Um, so a, a, you know, a, a bloom filter, so I'm going to be coming at this very much from the context of um, kind of Hadoop distributed computation, right? Um, a, a bloom filter is, um, is used all over the place, right? Often when um, you want to know, so uh, you have a bunch of machines, you have data distributed over a bunch of them, um, you want to look up um, some value in each of them, and you have a bloom filter that caches in memory sort of what values are on disk, and so you can quickly check in the bloom filter to see whether or not it's worth looking in disk for this value. Um, or um, if you're doing a join, um, especially like a, a join of a very large table to a very small table, um, one thing that you might do is um, produce a, um, a bloom filter of all of the keys in the small table, right, and, uh, and ship that over to all of the various partitionings of the large table that you've got like spread over your distributed file system, and then you can use that to filter the large table down considerably, and then you have fewer keys that actually need to go into your shuffle or whatever it is. Um, a hyperlog log, you know, anytime you, I mean, unique visitors is the like classic use case for this, right? So, you know, you want to know over this very large stream of events how many unique visitors you had that day or that month or that year. Um, and the fact that you can union them is really nice. Um, so, you know, as a, as a trivial example, right, if you store the hyperlog log for each day of the month and then you want to know the unique visitors like across the whole month, you can just union those up. Um, which is quite an efficient operation and, and then get that, right? Um, you can also imagine sort of more complicated analytics stuff where you have a whole bunch of like segmentations, like, you know, segmented by, that's segmentation by time, but you might also segment by geo or whatever. Um, and so you want to union up a bunch of these little sort of shards and, and see how many people are in them and then like see how much intersection there is with something else. Um, min hash, which is about set similarity, um, is very often used for like personalization algorithms or recommendation algorithms. Um, so, you know, uh, Google News uses this where uh, there's one set which is like the number of articles that I have liked and or read and there's another set which is the number of articles that you have read and they want to see how similar we are to each other um, because if we're similar enough then maybe if you read an article they want to recommend it to me, right? Um, or, you know, other similar, similar similarity stuff, right? Um, Count min sketch, one of the main applications of count min sketch is like a, a heavy hitters, um, so a streaming heavy hitters. So what that means is that if you, so the count min sketch bound is basically um, uh, the, the percentage uh, of the stream has a percentage error, right? So I can say with certain uh, error bounds that this item is, you know, makes up 6% of the items I've seen over the stream or whatever. And so what you might do is say, I want to record any time 
um, an item is, is estimated to be greater than like 1% of my stream or 2% of my stream or something like that, I want to keep track of it. And so along with my count min sketch, I'll keep a, a list of sort of all of the items that have been estimated to be above that. Um, count min sketch is also very useful um, back to, to joins in a distributed context um, because um, estimating the frequency of various keys tells you a lot about what kind of join algorithm you might want to use um, and uh, you know how skewed it is. And so one of the things that, um, that count min sketch gives you a very good estimate of is what sometimes people call the F2 or the second frequency moment, which is like the, anyway, it's the dot product of the frequencies, but basically it's a measure of skew. Um, and so count min sketch is very good for that. Count min sketch is also, uh, this gets really involved, but if you build up a tree of them, it's a way that you can estimate percentiles. So you can end up getting um, both range queries and you can get like medians or 90th percentiles or whatever, which tends to be a really hard thing to get a good estimate of in a distributed context um, or in a streaming context. But um, if you use like, you know, enough, um, basically if you use sort of log n, um, count min sketches, it, given that you have n distinct values, then uh, you can get really good estimates on, on percentile stuff. Um, so, you know, those are the things that, that I've looked into using these for. I mean, I'm, I'm sure there's a bunch of other things that, that other people use them for. So uh, a cache is another kind of approximate set? Yeah. With the other Inverted, false. right. Yeah. Would, um, is this API biased to the Bloom filter style of sets, would a cache make sense uh, here, It's not, no, right. So, so an, uh, an expiring cache, right, um, if it tells you that the thing is there, it's definitely there. Um, if you tells you that the thing is not there, it, uh, it might have just fallen out of cache, and, uh, and you would just use approximate Boolean, but your trues would have the probability set to one, and your falses would have the probability set to something, right, which is the inverse of what a Bloom filter does, but, but the API would actually be exactly the same. Yeah, so there is a lack of intersection between intersection and union. As far as I can think, that's completely orthogonal to the, what we're talking about, that the, the, the contains, you know, whether, whether it's, I don't know the technical terms for this, right, but, but whether it's biased towards false positives or false negatives, right? Uh, yeah, in the few algorithms where you need to uh, use k different hash functions, can you talk about what, if any, constraints there are on the different hash functions and uh, what hash functions you would tend to use or how you do that? Yeah, so what we use is murmur hash three, um, and murmur hash three takes a seed. Um, and so the, the approach that we've been using anyway is um, use a fixed seed to initialize a random number generator, use that random number generator to generate k different seeds, use those k different seeds for k different murmur hash uh, variants. Um, I have like no formal, you know, justification for that. Um, it seems empirically to work fine. So um, Kirsch and, uh, Kirsch and uh, Mitchemacher uh, did a formal study where they showed that you can use two hash functions as long as they're linearly separable, and you can use linear combinations of those to get n hash functions with a decay of about one or two percent worth of overall efficiency in the algorithm. So if you're looking for a way to cut your hashing cost, that may save you a lot of work. Yeah, thank you. Why does approximate Boolean have a Boolean value? It's, it's just a probability. That's a good question. I'm still thinking about it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Oscar's going to answer that one. The real answer is that you want to push all kinds of proofs through about like not or and or or and if you know something about the the space that you're working in you can actually do that if you give me like an approximate a like it's 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 with probability it's at least with probability half a and then i want to combine it with some function like from a to b to c that that's also like you're going to give me an approximate b then i have to resort to relatively loose bounds about like the probability that i got c correct you have to only go with the and correctness, and that falls off exponentially. But the win that Avi showed, where you can, when you have cer certain facts about the way Booleans combine, that if you see an or, if, if either one of them are true, then you can, you can strengthen the bounds, and they don't necessarily fall off exponentially fast. That was the only reason for it.
Um, the question is how we persist these. Yeah, so that's a, that's a great question. Um, right now, the answer is badly, um, which is to say that we use the cryo um, library for, for serialization. Um, that's great for temporary storage when it's like just going from the map nodes to the reduce nodes across a Hadoop cluster. Um, and often that's all that we need, right? Often you're sort of going to pull a, a final answer out of it and that's what you actually need to persist in the long term. Um, but, you know, serializing with that particular framework on disk uh, does not seem like a robust long term solution. So one of the things that we are adding to Algebird um, is more stable long term um, bijections to and from uh, byte arrays. Um, but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Couldn't resist, um, <laughs> but uh, but yeah. So so that's 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 a big to do item actually for the framework right now. Um, most of these effectively get represented as bit fields, right? So um, it's not like serializing them is, is hard, but uh, but there does need to be better code in there than there is right now. Thanks. <laughs>